Feeling Dog Podcast. It's your host T. Lee and my co-host Jack Cowden will be live today as usual. Was pulling up there acting like they couldn't see me. Now she want to clean me up like a squeegee. I told her that's on me, baby, like yellow BZ. With a peanut butter tear like a Reese. He's going to persevere through all the obstacles. Get it done. That's an underdog. They don't forget the underdog when they see me. I hit them with the John Cena, they can see me. You may overlook this person, but the underdog is the one who's going to put in the word. It's over, you know? Because you have to lose to win, whether you think losing is a big event. Out of mind. All I'm saying is be careful who you idolize. I'm kicking these scriptures just before the fame. Ain't no cap in my words, I go against the grain. So I always believed in life. I took so many risks to make this thing happen, you know what I mean? I'm always working, bro. Like, uh, I just, like I said, I'm energy driven. The underdog can put you on your ass. The underdog can put you on game. The underdog can show you something that you didn't know. Can't go down. All you can do is go up. So are you going to stay where you at or are you going to move up? Do the bangs. Do the bangs. He said he's nervous. This is his first time doing it. Hey, hey, hey. Yo, yo, what it do, good people? It's your host, Fleetwood JR from the Underdogs Podcast, and we back with another episode, another major episode today. We got season five, episode 11, Folly of Bliss, the art of unlearning, featuring Savannah Zone, by way of Atlanta, multidisciplinary artist and futurist, Renaissance Ralph Dillard. Got him in the building today. What's going on, brother? How you feeling? Maintaining, man. Been doing good. I can't complain. Yeah, what's up, man? Like I say, you know, you know, Ren's work is Ren's Ralph Dillard, but artistry Ren, right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody calls me Ren. Okay, so Ren's work says a lot of the misconception about life and the nature of reality we observe sort from other people. We are mostly unaware of the different ways this social conditioning impacts our day-to-day decisions and value system. And, um, you know, with that being said, you know, with a lot of how you said the social impacts and everything, I feel like, you know, as we're growing up and the stuff that we're learning and stuff like that, like everything has an impact and influence on us. But I specifically feel like, you know, with our culture and everything like that is just like I say, the, the art of unlearning, you know, to relearn everything again, different from what was told, you know, from one side to another. Um. Yeah, that's that's definitely uh that's definitely dope right there. I feel like that you pointed that out. Um yeah, I, I think um a lot of people underestimate the idea that you know we do live in the matrix. Like people see the movies and they hear people talk about it in, in popular culture, like, oh yeah, we're in the matrix in the matrix. But we are like literally in a construct of meaning. And that's conveyed through language. And so whoever controls the meanings of the words that you use to define your reality, mm. that's the person that actually built your matrix. Oh, man. Nah, definitely. And then I feel like, too, you know, whoever, when we when we look at a standpoint of America and stuff like that, whoever controls the, when it come to people saying racism and throwing that word around, it's really just who controls the resources, the wealth, you know, basically economy, you know, that's what, you know, you would consider that is not, I don't like you because of this color and all that. Like, that's the ignorance that they told everybody below them to believe that when really is who controls the whole narrative, paints the picture, you know? Uh, yeah. Especially, specifically black folks, man. You know, when you think about it, we don't know where any of our resources come from. Like, we go to the grocery store and the chicken is already wrapped in plastic oh, or the, the vegetables are already in a can. You <laughs> don't know where the stuff actually originated from to actually get right. to our dinner plates. We have no idea where our medicine comes from. We go to the pharmacy and pick it up. We have no idea where our electricity comes from. We flip the light switch and the, the room's illuminated, but we don't know how to generate any of these things, where the water comes from where the gas comes from, you know, we just kind of are on the back end um, consuming all of the stuff, but we have no idea about where all of the stuff kind of originates from. Nah, definitely. And I feel like, uh, 
you know, everything that once was, you know, how everything always comes back around. I feel like we're going to eventually get back to the roots, you know, of everything how it was in the beginning. You know, we used to grow on stuff, you know, do a lot of things self-sufficiently, then depending on, you know, where the next meal coming from this person or whatever, for them to feed us. Like, you know, I feel like it's a... uh in today's time, especially looking from a futuristic point of view, you know, when you watch how society is moving and stuff, it's like, you know, future wise, I feel like, you know, Black Wall Street eventually come back around, you know, like we'll eventually right. get back to it. It's just, you know, time and seeing, you know, hopefully I live in a lifetime where, you know, we do come, you know, come back around to it. But, uh, well, you know, even even something like the Black Wall Street, you know, you, right. you think about Wall Street as a um as sort of this economic entity that europeans built you know just keeping it 1000 and then we will kind of let attach onto that and call it black wall street as mm -hmm. opposed to defining something that of our own so we always kind of use their definitions and their meanings as our qualifiers my nah, facts um but yeah since since we um we're getting right into it, man. You know, like I say, we appreciate you, you know, taking time out your schedule. But like in 30 seconds, who is Renaissance, you know, Ralph Dillard as a person? Like outside of artistry, like, you know, what type of person are you? You know, um, I'm somebody who has always been curious about the nature of reality and about the underlying um, purpose and the underlying kind of um, underpinnings of the world that we live in. And so as I've researched over the years and, and rubbed up against those kind of different philosophical ideas um, over the years, I just kind of um, realized that my art is a vehicle to communicate those ideas to brothers and sisters who look like me, who may not have the discipline or may not even have the interest to sit down and read uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Egyptian Book of the Dead or, uh, gosh, The Secret Doctrine by Madame H.P. Blavatsky or um, the Tao Te Ching or the I Ching. Um, <clears throat> my job, I think, as an artist is to figure out how to communicate those ideas to uh, a group of people who may or may not be interested in it just yet. But, um, you know, I feel like that's a, if, if I die after having done enough of that i feel like my life will, will have been a life worth living i uh, definitely respect that man like you know for you to convey you know the readings and stuff like that like you say um you know most of our people won't pick up the book and you know so it's just like through the visual representation with you being a visual artist you can use all that in your work um the egyptians had hieroglyphics you know, and so it wasn't actual like language, you know, it was pictures. And so I feel like, you know, maybe in a past lifetime, maybe that's what I was doing was, was etching these pictures in stone. Yeah, most definitely. So as we're reaching the quarter of 2024, how has this year been treating you thus far? And uh, what are some things you learned, you know, last year that helped you prepare for this year? Um, yeah, so far th this year has honestly had its fair share of challenges. Like I've been kind of, I feel like I've been spinning a lot of different plates. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of different opportunities that seem to be just coming my way and a lot of different seeds that I planted um, last year now seem to be kind of blossoming and, and pushing their way through the soil. So, um, so far this year has, has been good. Um, it, it feels like it's going by fast, right? right. You know, it's already April, and I, I just remember 2024 is just starting, and it's right. like the first quarter is already over with. Facts. Nah, that's definitely true, man. That's why it's just like, all right, you know, when you're setting goals and stuff, it's just like, okay, by the summer, summer's about to be right around the corner, and then next <laughs> thing you know, we're back in winter. Like, it's going to feel like the heat didn't last that long, man. <laughs> yeah. um, there's this idea too called the, the quickening. And mm -hmm. um, it's this idea that like the perception of time seems to speed up as um, our sense of uh, reality starts to break down. And so um, 
another way to look at it is, is if you were two years old, one year out of your life would be 50% of your life. So that one year would be much more significant to a two year old because that's a whole 50% of their life. And so as you get older and older and older, say you're 10 years old, then one year is 10% of your life. And so each year starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of significance, the older you get. Yeah, I definitely feel that, man. Cause like, you know, like you say, you'll be looking at it like, man, I like, I just remember being in high school and high school like 12 years ago. Like, <laughs> man, it's just, it's running by. Oh, um, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So, Ralph Dillard, a multi disciplinary creator with many accolades. Your journey starting as early as 2006. But first, we have to touch on the early foundation. Growing up in Savannah, Georgia, what was your childhood like early on from your perspective? It was great. Um, my parents have been together for 56 years, I want to say. So they've been together for a long time. Um, I grew up always having my mom and my dad as a, a constant influence in my life, as a constant resource whenever I had issues or whenever um, I remember sometimes getting pulled over by the police or um, even going to jail or something like that. Like I always knew my parents were like the safety net and they weren't going to let me stay in that situation. And that was incredibly empowering to me as a creative because I felt like I could be creative and make mistakes, but I knew I had a safety net and I knew I had people that loved me and, and that would uh, prioritize my health and safety. Nah, that's real. So when you, um, do you visit back home sometimes, you know, even with the transit to Atlanta? Yeah. Yeah. I always have. I lived in Philadelphia for quite a while, um, before I moved to Atlanta okay. and, um, I would always, even then still fly back down to Savannah. Um, I was born on the 4th of July, so I, I've never known a year of my life without, um, some sort of party on my birthday, right. know, some kind of fireworks or yeah. barbecue or something. Like that's oh, been God. consistent throughout my whole life. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of times I would fly home to Savannah when I lived in Philadelphia. And now that I'm in Atlanta, I'll drive home and, and um, try to spend that time with the people who kind of know me best. So when, when you're back home visiting, like what are some of your go-to places, you know, to either hang out or, you know, sp spots that's notable for, you know, where you go grab something to eat? Like for those who never been through Savannah, like what's your recommendation? <laughs> um, you know what? Whenever I go home, I always make it a um I always make it a tradition to stop by this place called Carrie Hilliards. And it's a seafood place. Savannah's right on the coast. Um, they call it the Low Country. And um, so there's always fresh seafood. And um one Carrie Hilliards isn't like the tip of the spear in terms of seafood in Savannah, Georgia, but that's where I used to eat a lot when I lived there. And so whenever I go home, I, I just always go and get um, a, a combination three seafood uh, platter with shrimp and uh, flounder and uh, scallops. And um, oh, yeah. yeah, that's that's my go to spot for eating. As far as art is concerned, uh, mm -hmm. Savannah, you know, obviously is home of SCAD, which is uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. And so SCAD has a major influence on the art community in Savannah, being that close. We aren't necessarily a college town, but SCAD definitely does have a, a large footprint as far as the art community is concerned. Um, but there are also museums like the uh, Ralph Mark Gilbert Museum. Um, there's uh, the Telfair Arts Museum. Um, and I'm actually uh, excited personally about being uh, in a show that they're having coming up in June at the Telfair Arts Museum back home. Um, and then there's a whole smorgasbord of different galleries uh, that uh, we used to do spoken word events um, inside of and in, uh, coffee houses where we would have um, like jam sessions and work with musicians. So, you know, Savannah's a uh, kind of uh, low key place, but it's got a really rich tradition in the arts. That's what's up. So when it comes to the foundation of your childhood, you know, what's some of your earliest uh, moments 
you know, with art, you know, reflecting now that basically like lit the fuel with the match, you know, that created this burning desire you have now, you know, as an artist and a philosopher, like, you know, what's some of your childhood moments you can remember? Well, um, philosophy has always sort of been the steering wheel of my visual art. And so um, I remember that really being rooted really strongly in the church. And, um, I used to grow up singing in the church choir, um, going to Sunday school every Sunday. Um, and I remember the Sunday school teachers they used to kind of wag their finger at me and like, and, and foreheads would be all wrinkled. And they'd be like, well, you go, you're going to be a preacher one day because all you do is ask questions. All you do is ask questions. And I used to wonder like, where, where are the dinosaurs in the Bible? You know, uh, like they had like millions of years on the earth. Like, why are the dinosaur, dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Right. Um, why aren't the ice ages mentioned in the Bible? I used to ask them all these questions. And they really, you know, were just Sunday school teachers who kind of taught part time, you know, at their church. They didn't, they weren't like well researched or nothing like that. They were kind of just reading off the script. And I would be asking all these hard hitting questions. And um, back then, I didn't know, uh, now I know, but back then, I didn't realize that that would be the seed of me always questioning the nature of our reality and the, and the narratives that we're being sold and told. Um, and so that really kind of guided my philosophical interest really early on with the church. My artistic interest kind of came from my immediate family. My mom is a really good uh, um, drawer. She knows how to draw really well. My older sister knows how to draw really well. And so um, I just always knew how to draw. One of my first memories in life was drawing a bull on um, a, a you probably don't even know what this is, but a phone book back in the day, man. When I was, yeah, yeah, I was I doing, yeah. With the numbers, yeah. The big fat yeah. back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yep, exactly. Yeah, and my mom tore the uh, the image off of it and put it on our refrigerator, and um, she showed all of the neighbors and like showed all of her sisters and like everybody who came to the house. She was, she really championed that um, early image of mine that I drew. And I remember thinking to myself, like, you know what, I can get used to this. I, I, I remember feeling like I was an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's up, man, because I feel like, you know, early in our childhood is when, you know, like we have different, you know, desires or talents and stuff we're into. That's like our, you know, what I want to say, our peak moments, you know, until we grow into what we, you know, become. Um, right. So how would you define art, you know, in Ren's own word? Like, what is art, you know, from your definition and perspective? You know, I get asked that from time to time in different uh, interviews. And um, I really personally feel like there are a lot of renderers that are out here. And renderers are the people who could, like, do wanted posters or would do, like, a sketch of a... Um, of some sort of suspect, you know, for the newspaper or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, renderers are also people who do, who play like cover songs, you know, like a cover band. Yeah. But they, they might be able to play like a great Prince cover, but they could never actually write the song that Prince wrote mm -hmm. because that song that Prince wrote came out of his nutsack. Mm -hmm. And so to me, an artist is somebody who is able to bring something out of the ether, out of an unseen realm that nobody has access to except for that artist. And that artist is able to bring that out into our realm. Um, and, and that's that's always been my criteria for an artist. Some of that stuff I like, some of it I don't like. But to me, as long as it's something original, something that you're doing that really kind of came out of your core essence or your core constitution, I will, I will consider that art versus being just a rendering or just a copycat or a cookie cutter version of what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Now, original definitely beats everything. You know, that's how I look at it in all type of aspects. You know, it's just like you could hear the a remake of a song a million times, but that it don't sound nothing like the original did, you know? Right. Oh, right. That's exactly it. 
So who would be your top influential artist of all time that has had an impact on your, you know, you early on and, you know, today's time that's still impactful? Um, Early on, some of my, my earlier influences artistically, um, gosh, that's, that's an interesting question. Visually, I would say I've okay. always loved uh, Salvador Dali, um, but probably just as much as I've loved Salvador Dali or, or Alex Gray or uh, Romare Bearden. Those are some of my, my big um, visual influences. I would say um, Black Thought from The Roots or uh, Most Deaf from, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So all those cats, D'Angelo, um, Eric, Erica Badu, um, gosh, Jill Scott, like all of that, all of that music um, was so heavily influential in my my visual style that it would be um, I would be remiss to not mention them when I talk about my my early influences. Yeah, that's a vibe. You know, I get poetic vibes and it's real deep with them when you saying most deaf and like when you speak calm and alone, like it just get deep, you know, and I can see that because I always say like, you know, doing music and being an artist is like if you're a creative, you will find a way to enjoy all type of art, you know, not just mm-hmm. I do music. I just listen to music like now. Nah, I like what I like looking at art too because it's speaking to me. I'm in my inner thoughts as I'm looking at this piece, you know, or I can actually see what's going on, you know, like things of like that. So now nah, definitely right. um I feel that. So uh which yeah. piece oh, well, just, just to throw a caveat yeah. in there. Um that's always a good fellas, a great first date if you ever really want to go on a a romantic evening, like take her to a art museum or mm-hmm. an opening reception for an art show. And that way you guys aren't forced to sit across from each other at a table and just kind of like, you know, play tennis with questions back and forth with <laughs> each other. There's actually now this third thing that y'all can both look at that takes the pressure off of y'all interaction. And you can kind of see what she's laughing at, what she gravitates towards, what she likes visually. And if you're attentive enough, you can get a lot of information just from like taking her to a, a art opening or a museum or something like that, like, you know, for a first date. So it's a little free game. I feel that because you know when you sit there and the artist is speaking about that art, you got that moment of silence, you know. So when it's time to sit there and look at what you think about the art, this is what I see. Then they get like you say, you can get a lot of feelings. You know, you could tell a lot of things through art based on that, you know, that feedback, you know. So it's like you could figure out a lot of things with just based off what she's telling you, what she sees and how she said when she said, like, you know, things of that. Now, I get that. Exactly. And it take all the pressure off of you. you Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) For real. I feel that. So. Um, which piece of your work, you know, from your portfolio, would you say is your favorite piece and why? And also take us through that time period when you created it and how did it come about and what was going on, you know, in your life around that time as well? Um, well, you know, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, so I, I end up doing a lot of different types of artwork. Um, yeah, the stuff you're showing now. That's a lot of my my visual work, but I'm also a spoken word artist. Um, I'm also a writer, um, a teacher, um, and I'm also a curator. And so all of those things uh, kind of inform my vision. Um, so as opposed to kind of just going through each genre of the things that I do, um, yeah. I would say at a glance, my last piece, because that's... <laughs> That's my favorite piece, you know, and that's that's usually how it works. Like the Andre 3000, how he says every new verse is a, is a new curse for him. Yeah. So like every new piece is um is is a new height. And what ends up happening is, is you climb that mountain with this new piece of artwork um, and you get to the summit and then you look around and there are all these other mountains that now you feel like, oh, I got to try to climb these two. Um, but I really love where I am right now creatively. I feel like I'm creating some of the best work um, that I 
have ever created. And um, right now I'm working a lot with uh, precious metals and um, I'm also an oil painter as well. Uh, but I do love this idea of mixed media collage that I'm, I'm really exploring right now heavy. It allows me to get my ideas out a lot faster than if I was trying to paint everything. And so that that to me is really valuable. So that's the answer right now is or the last piece I created. And um, I'm really enjoying myself right now as an artist, especially in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, most definitely. Um, but yeah, make sure everybody y'all head over to renswork.com. And uh, for everything you described, man, like I was telling you, it was just like an abundance of different things going on with you, man. That's why I was like, you know, let me try to, because it's like, it's kind of, I would say it would take maybe two or three interviews to catch up with everything going on. But uh, good stuff. Yeah, it's like, it's good like stuff. your talent stacking, man. You know, it's, it's really, that's what it speaks to me when you say you're, you know, multi, you know, multidisciplinary artist, you know, so it's like, you're not just st sticking to one thing. You have a lot of different things going on, but they all work together, you know? Yeah, that piece that you just um, scrolled past, if I had to really think of something, that one right there, um, if I had to think of one piece that was really meaningful to me, right? that is a piece um, that is a dedication to my friend, uh, Clinton D. Powell. And he uh, was my... Um, co-conspirator in Savannah a lot. Um, we did a lot of a lot of really good work. We started the, the Savannah Spoken Word Festival, um, and we started this group that's still existing right now. That's called the Spitfire Poetry Group. And uh, he actually passed away um, quite a while ago now in, in 2012. But um, I still probably think about him every day. And so I had been reluctant to do a piece that honored him. And um, finally, I sat down and did this piece. His name is Clinton Powell. And so this piece is called uh, Anubis Taking Clinton to the Scales. And um, Anubis is the Egyptian god of mm. death. And actually, Anubis is the Egyptian god. He's almost like the bailiff or like the policeman that comes and gets you and kind of yeah. serves you your warrant. And then Osiris is actually the Egyptian god of death. But um, the, the person who actually does all of the legwork is Anubis. And um, I have him and my friend Clinton going to the scales. And you'll see a scale there. And uh, supposedly, that scale is representative of Ma'at, who is the goddess of, um, the goddess of uh, justice and balance and truth. And so um, what happens is, is in Egyptian mythology is they weigh your heart against um, the weight of a feather. And if you were a good person and a decent person and you tried your absolute best in that, in that particular lifetime, um, hopefully your heart will be lighter than that feather because you don't have a heavy heart with a lot of burdens and a lot of regrets. Um, and you, you looked at the world as play as opposed to um, you know being so serious. And not so much like playing like a kid plays with the ball or like somebody plays with a video game, right. but more so like playing the piano or, or playing the violin. And mm -hmm. so um, Anubis is taking my friend Clinton to the scales. And um, if you look at the scales, the heart is just a little bit, I made sure it was just a little bit lighter than the feather. Mm -hmm. And um, even though I know all the dirty did during <laughs> during this lifetime, <laughs> but um, you know, hopefully that was a good uh, a good omen for him, or or a good um, I don't know addition to, to maybe help him along his path in, in the unseen realm. Yeah, man, that's deep. Yeah, and if your heart is lighter than a feather, you get to choose from twelve different gates. And in that particular image, you'll see 12 different gates that you can go into that'll help oh, you. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And you can kind of, if you ever see the piece, you'll be able to actually see little small kind of thumbnails of different worlds that you could, that you could choose yeah. from. And if your heart is heavier than the feather, 
yeah. that crocodile underneath the scale will come up and uh, consume you and bring you back into three dimensional reality on Earth. Mm. That's when it's got to do it all over again. Got to do it all over again. Yep. Yeah, I've, man. If you know, you know. Yeah, but that's man. our that's our mythology. That's our story. You know, and, and a lot of that stuff has been forgotten, and that's why I feel like it's my job as an as an artisan to try to communicate that to brothers who might not they they might be thinking about the, the Kendrick and Drake beef or whatever right now. Like mm-hmm. they're not even thinking, you know. Mm-hmm. Man. about all this other stuff it's distractions that's that's exactly that's exactly what we stand on man it's like you saying it without saying it like you know like that's that's the whole purpose of you know everything we're doing man is to make sure the awareness is there like it's a lot of stuff distracting you know and stuff that we need to be paying attention to you know um absolutely so, so how how would you say you know your upbringing shaped your perspective on creativity and innovation? Um, you know, again, just just having that um, nice level of stability, I think, just makes such a huge difference. Because if you don't have that, all you have in your life typically are a lot of distractions, and so you end up, you know getting involved in some rabbit hole that really Mm. doesn't lead to the cosmic um, evolution of your soul. So I always say to people, if the devil is anything, the devil is distraction. How the devil actually manifests in our physical reality and physical phenomena is um, flashing neon lights and, you know, this this, IG models and like, you know, yeah. everything looks good that, over here. Consume all the, yeah. Yeah. And you only still have the same 24 hours in a day. So um, people had a lot less decisions to make back in the day. You know, you didn't have to pick from 130 different salad dressings to figure out which one you wanted to to eat. You know, you might have had right. three or four and that was the one you picked. Yeah. So now you got 130. Yeah. But you only still have the same 24 hours in a day. Thanks. So the more distractions you have, the less time you actually have to work on your soul. And then the devil got you, got you back in this loop, constant loop of coming back here because you never actually found a way to, to perfect your, your spiritual self. Yeah. And I and I deeply feel that, man, like, you know, like with age and time, you know, and I feel like it's important for everybody to get to know themselves, you know, figure out yourself, you know. And that's why I feel like, you know, you open that that eye of seeing reality as reality rather than distraction, you know. Yeah, every major religion at its core, if you really get down to the core ethic of just about every major religion, mm-hmm. there um, is this one line that says, know thyself. And knowing thyself is akin to knowing God. Mm-hmm the life essence inside of you that animates you and that gives you consciousness and awareness that's actually the godhead so the closer you can actually rub up against that and get to know that um i think that's what every major religion is pointing at the problem is is that we try to change all of these meta metaphysical and metaphorical texts and scriptures into history books and then we start fighting over the history versus <laughs> understanding the metaphor that's telling you how to live your life in the present. Yeah. Nah, I feel that, man. Um, so early on, were there like any challenges you faced in pursuing, you know, your artistic interests? And um, how did you overcome them? Well, you know what? Um, so I've done just about everything artistically probably i won't say everything but um i started off as a singer so i used to, to sing in like a a quartet almost on some kind of boys to men kind of 112 type yeah thing. okay um and we would uh we would harmonize and do all of this stuff all the time and but we were always covering other people's music and yeah. so um i just i decided one day i was like you know what you know guys i want to write for us um, and so I started writing our songs back in the day. And um, 
that ended up morphing into me writing um, poems that ended up um, ultimately putting me on stage and doing spoken word. And um, from that, I ended up hosting a radio show. I hosted a radio show for about four years uh, called Renaissance Radio um, in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and, you know, all of this actually preceded me uh, even really doing visual art as, as heavy as I do it now. And so um, I've done all of those different things. We started the Savannah Spoken Word Festival. Um, we started this group, uh, the Spitfire Poetry Group, that still in, is in, in existence right now that works with um, impoverished uh, youth and um, kids who have made different mistakes in life. And we actually teach them alternative ways to express themselves through poetry and spoken word as opposed to using their hands and their fists. And so um, I've had all of these different stops along the way. And, you know, you would think all of these things are disconnected, but it's so interesting because they all come from the same source, mm -hmm. um, the same sort of creative uh, engine um, drives all of those different artistic uh, articulations. And so, yeah, um, I've, I've had all these different stops along the way and they all have kind of crescendoed to what I'm doing now. And I feel proud about that. So you feel like, you know, every like stop along the way just created something else that just backed off of that basically and just created a whole nother, you know, yeah, another lane. Yeah, it, it's a will. It's a will. You know, the, the dancer influences the the painter. Mm -hmm. Um, the painter uh influences the the writer, the writer influences um, you know, the the Gosh, the singer, I don't know, like, you know, it's just this, this oh, will that yeah. just kind of yeah. goes yeah. on and everything it all feeds is generated from the same place. Yeah, that's the talent exactly. stacking, man. Everything feeds each other, you know. It's just they all connected, you know, definitely. Yeah, the, the word renaissance itself actually um, references this time period, the, the renaissance period in um, mm -hmm. his story. Where they talk about his story, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, his story, yeah. not 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 the mystery, not my story, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, but his story. Um, but yeah, uh, the Renaissance man supposedly could sing, you know, he supposedly could play the the lyre, um, he supposedly could uh, fence really well. Um, I always even like to tell people, like, I've never lost a one on one fight in my life. Like, I don't even know what that feels like. That have mm -hmm. lost a one-on-one -on -one fight and so um this the, the renaissance man could, could paint um you know he was good at a lot of different things so a lot of people gave me that moniker back in the day renaissance and when i moved to philadelphia i used to go to open mics and uh i would sign the open mic list is renaissance and so i could see the person the host would be like rolling his eyes like all right up next is renaissance like who does this dude think he is called right. renaissance? and yeah. so um I, I realized after like two or three open mics it, it shrank that down to a uh, ren and um and that's what everybody called me back home anyway but i, I left the i left the moniker renaissance alone after that and, and just went with, with ren no, nah, but it's like the Renaissance. The vet, the, it's still Ren. It's the same, you know. It it, it yeah. turned into Ren today. Um, yeah. But so let's talk about the transition to Philadelphia too, man. Like, what was that like? Cause you leaving Savannah, and going up to Philly, like that's that's a culture shock in a way, isn't it? Woo, dude, you talking about a culture shock, man? I had no idea, and I left um, in the middle of the winter. It was like January. And so I went from kind of warm savanna, mm -hmm. you know, almost tropic, you know, almost equator kind of weather to Philadelphia, which I think at the time it was like nine degrees the first day I moved up there. And um, it was freezing um, in Savannah, in Georgia, period. Like we aren't used to like rodents and stuff like that, and, yeah. and mice and stuff. But I remember um, seeing mice on the street and like rats and stuff were, or, or on trash cans and fighting and, and like people were just walking past them like yeah. that was yeah, just yeah. normal activity. And I just remember thinking like, wow, I thought those were squirrels, but those are rats over there. 
Mm-hmm. And so it was just a huge culture shock. Um, I'm, I was again used to like big lawns and and um, you know up there is like no uh, there weren't a lot of uh, big lawns at all and you know there were guys always standing on the corner I would look outside of my apartment at four o'clock in the morning and the street would still be popping mm-hmm. you know so that was such a huge difference in uh, in my life growing up in Savannah but it was needed and that, that's actually where I really started doing visual artists in Philadelphia. Okay, with that being said, too, you know, your journey was that in 2006, really, with that transition happening? Yeah, yeah, that's wow. when I really kind of tapped into. And, and again, you you very well researched, man. I, I, I appreciate that. I love seeing that. As you yeah, the man, I, I just had to go back to the roots and the foundation, man. We got to pull everything out the guard, you know. I see yeah. you, I see you, man. Salute. Um, yeah, back, back then, uh, I would. Uh, I was working for a logistics firm um, called uh, Kim Logics, and so I had a pretty long commute. I had about a 45-minute commute from where I lived at on Shelton Avenue in Philadelphia to um, my office uh, at this place called Kim Logics, and um, I would be driving back and forth, uh, either going to work or coming home. And Philadelphia has the most murals of any other city in the world. So you come to a stoplight or um, a stop sign and you look to your right or you look to your left and you see you would see all these amazing murals um, on buildings. And I remember driving by and I was, I was like, man, I could do that. I could do that. And um, I always knew I could draw, but I never really took it seriously because spoken word was always my thing. And um one day I stopped and bought some cheap acrylic paint from like Michaels or somewhere. I can't remember exactly where and uh, some cheap paint brushes and a canvas. And I painted this picture. I don't even remember what it was now at the time, but um, uh, a girl I was seeing at the time, um, uh, another, uh, actually she was a pretty dope um, poet as well, but um, she came over to my apartment and she saw the painting and she was like, Yo, where did you buy that from? That's dope. And I was like, nah, I painted that. And she was like, you painted that? And I was like, yeah, I painted that. And that was the first time she actually ever came over to my house and, and she stayed the night, you know, uh, uh, kind of as a result of finding out that I painted that painting. Yeah. And I remember waking up the next morning and I was just like, yeah, I'm a painter. Yeah, this is, mm-hmm. this is it right here. And so um, I haven't looked back from, from, from that time period. Man, that's real. So, you know, are there any routines from your childhood that you still incorporate in your creative process, you know? Um, you know, so early on, um, when I was a child, we had a, a folding table. It used to be a little blue folding table. And my dad would set it up for me in our living room in front of the fireplace. And I would just sit there and draw for hours, hours. And um, I had a, a best friend of mine. He's a preacher now. He lives in St. Louis. Uh, but uh, we would both sit at that table and just make up characters and just draw and draw and draw. And um, again, it's this idea of pulling something from nothing. So we would read X-Men and we would read, you know, DC comics and all of these different comic books and watch these different cartoons, and, like Kung Fu Theater and all of this stuff. We see their heroes, but we had a little subculture uh, amongst my friends where we would almost kind of, um, it was almost like baseball cards where we would compete against each other who could make like the dopest um, character of our own. And so uh, I was always like pulling these different characters just out of my ass. Like, um, and that's something that I still do to this day. Like, I, I feel like I create. Um, imagery that is hopefully unique and hopefully when you see it you know it references me and you know you don't think about anybody else when you see when you see my work hopefully it feels like something that that i came up with and um that was something i started out uh, with really young nah that's that's that says a lot because you know typically um you know when it works like it's like 
kind of in the sense of you know if Jordan playing basketball and he doing something that he's he used to do as a kid but it's creating those results you know it's just a part of the routine it's just like this has been the routine going on it's been working all I can do is enhance the routine but keep the fundamentals there like the same fundamentals mm -hmm. um, probably even bigger than that just to add a caveat in there I used to read a lot too when I was younger yeah um, I would just read ravenously and um that's something that's been consistent throughout my whole life like I've always just been a reader um and I've always really um consumed a lot of information right now while, while I'm in the studio working um a lot I will put on my headsets or or, or put on the bluetooth and just listen to lectures and listen to podcasts and, and listen to um, audio books and still download all of that information um, the same way I used to. Nah, definitely. Um, yeah, them audio books, man. Um, so when you're listening to the audible, audible books and lectures, like it just gives you, it gives you more information, but from an art, artistic, you know, uh, from an artistic like expression you're able to like kind of i guess get images from it as you're hearing it like or ideas in a way to bring it yeah, like you say yeah. get, bring it from that realm that's exactly it uh, and and on top of that you know so you're creating work you're creating ip which is you know intellectual property so you know there's that component of it where you're creating the the physical um, uh, version of these sort of higher philosophical ideas. And so that exists on the left hand, but then on the right hand, you have the market that you have to contend with as well. And you know, you, you have to make them aesthetically pleasing for people enough that they want to actually hang this shit on their walls. So um, there's a really sort of balancing act or, or, or a fine line where um, you can be a bit too preachy if you're not careful mm. and so you want to make sure you have a balance with um having work that's meaningful and that um is fulfilling to people but it's also got to be aesthetically pleasing as well yeah i'm i'm pretty sure like you know like you say you you create work that's like i say visually like appealing to people but then when you're a, a artist looking at other artists work i'm pretty sure you can decipher it as if like i see what they were doing right here like i know what's yeah. going on in this like you know versus like i say you got people that just look at it and it's like okay that looks nice you know or whatever or i like this over here but then you can probably as an artist probably feel the emotion and all type of things behind the art piece like do you get that feeling sometimes when you you're doing these curating these shows and stuff like that like you get like some type of attachment to some of the pieces pieces like things you might oh, see absolutely that might not see absolutely yeah that that's one of the beautiful components of being a curator is the fact that i actually get to work with a lot of incredible artists as well and so i get to get you know behind the scenes and understand their logic and their thinking behind the pieces that they create which only kind of enriches the soil uh where my work is uh bubbles up from so um you know that's a that's a beautiful uh, uh, component of being a curator but also being a curator it means that almost how i create these collages um and i use uh magazine clippings and printouts and all kinds of different fine papers to create, to pull all that stuff together to create a message. Uh, I feel like being a curator is creating a collage with other people's artwork. So now um, I'm actually reaching out to artists that I know will help to communicate this idea mm. and um, putting them in this show next to another artist that I reached out to for the same reason. And now both of those two pieces on the wall together, now they are speaking to each other they have yeah. a, a a communication yeah nah that's that's dope man like like you say to be able to see the vision and be able to put everything together like that because like i say any individual going to the art show they'll think that that whole column is just all that one artist's work when you might have 
three artists and they work just like you say a line together it looked like it's supposed to be there you know yeah and that that really um was really pronounced in the show that you came to um, where we actually first met yeah. uh, I, I i'd like to think i did a really good job with that one yeah nah it definitely would um so can you discuss the significance of afrofuturism futurism in your work and how it shapes your artistic and philosophical narratives yeah so uh, afrofuturism is a and, a and again we talked about whoever gives the meanings of these words they control the matrix right yep. so there was a white dude named uh, mark Derry who came up with the term afrofuturism in in the 90s and so all of these artists um both uh musical artists and visual artists all flocked to this idea um, that this white man came up with called Afrofuturism. It's like they used to call mm -hmm. us like African-Americans or Afro-Americans and all yeah. this stuff, right? Yeah. And so again, they control these narratives based on the codes. And yep. just a side caveat before it remind me to get back to Afrofuturism, because sometimes I'll, I'll get lost where I'm going. Gotcha. But um, so F-I-R-E, is fire, which is a code for a flame that, you know, if F-I-R-E is nothing compared to holding your hand above a lighter for like one minute or being super cold outside and standing in front of the fireplace, you know, or or cooking some something that you killed over the fire, over a grill or something like that. Fire is just a code for that experience. Uh, mm -hmm. W A T E R is what we call water, but it doesn't call itself water, right? Um, water can't wet itself, fire can't burn itself. Um, if W A T E R is nothing compared to being extremely thirsty, and somebody sliding a tall glass of cold water across the table to you and you swallowing it down, there's that experience of this thing. Yeah, or splashing it on your face when you're super hot, or taking a hot shower when you're dirty and stink and nasty. Mm -hmm. um, there's this experience of water, but then there's this code of water, you know, which is W A T E R yeah. or, or, I, or F I R E. And so I feel like um, over our lifetime, we read, we scan code from left to right. Like, so if you look at a page, you're scanning it from left to right. You're just scanning all this code, scanning code, scanning code. Probably over a lifetime, you've scanned a thousand miles of code, you know, and you don't even realize your eyes and your brains um, are, are code um, deciphering devices. So whoever controls that code controls your language, which is why mm -hmm. when you watch a movie like The Matrix, you see all of the, that green code coming up behind them, like going yeah. up. That's actually kind of explaining that same um, idea. So Afrofuturism is a code that this white man came up with, but we were already futurists. Um, you already had Sly the Family Stone. You already had uh, George Clinton um, and, the, and the whole P-Funk uh, Parliament, Funkadelic movement stuff mm -hmm. happening. You already had uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. You already had uh, Alice Coltrane. You already had um, uh, uh, Charlie Parker, you know, so, you know, we've always been Afrofuturist. Um, but it took, again, this white man to come up with this term Afrofuturism. Mm. Yeah, it come up with the code. Exactly. <laughs> oh, but man. I was like, because, <laughs> like, it's just like they came up with it so they could take credit, you know, but it already was going on. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, man. Yeah, we've always been futuristic. <laughs> As a matter of fact, all, there's so many. If you ever want to get dig deep um, into some of the inventions that Black people have come up oh, with, yeah. oh yeah, man, it will oh, yeah, blow yeah. your mind. They don't even teach us that out. in school about a lot of that stuff, man. Yep. It took me to get older to realize, man, we did so much, like, but they don't highlight it. <laughs> yeah, but they know who we are, you know. Yeah, yeah. they know who we are. Fact. We we don't. Facts. And you say whoever controls the language controls the narrative because I feel like even this language that we even speak of that we're even, you know, this is not our natural language. We're speaking as if 
we grew up in their, you know, in their territory, their land is English. <laughs> yep. Thank you. I'll, I'll even go so far as to say to you that even in your most intimate, most personal moment, when you're alone by yourself and you're talking to yourself in your head, whether it's you thinking about the future or thinking about the past or whatever, mm -hmm. or thinking about the present, or whatever it is that you're excited about, whatever it is you're fearful about. Um, whatever it is that you feel like you love, whatever it is you feel like you hate, those conversations that you're having in your head in your most intimate, most personal moments, you're still speaking to yourself in the language of the oppressor. Yeah. You don't even yeah. know what your own language is. Oh, <laughs> man, that's facts. That is facts. That's how deep, yeah. It's because, like you say, I'm from a infant to adult, our minds are programmed. So we downloaded all that information that they gave us, yep. you know, to where we have to unravel it, like you say, to unlearn, to relearn again, you know. Yep, yep, that's exactly it. Uh, so how do you approach the selection of mediums and materials in your artwork, you know, to enhance this conceptual meaning? Um, you know, um, again, being a multidisciplinary artist, that can shift and change mm. depending on what it is I'm working on. But visually, I used to go for what felt permanent because I felt like being a black man, everything that I did, it needed to be solid and firm and it needed to stand the test of time. So I, I would go to because they're trying to erase your history like as you create it and re redefine it and recontextualize it Man. as you're creating it so um i would go to museums and i would look to see what medium did these um ancient masters use that was stood the test of time that have lasted for thousands of years and so i was just like oh okay oil paint is what they were using so I'm going to start, I'm going to learn how to uh, paint with oil paint. So I spent years perfecting um, the art of, of painting with oil paint. Um, so that's that's one method. But oil paint is really slow because it's oil. It dries really slowly. Mm. Um, and there are different mediums you can use to speed it up, the dry time. But um, overall, it's a lot slower than if I were to create um you know, different collages that I create. And so I can really get out. Collages sometimes for me are kind of built for speed. So I can kind of get out these ideas and communicate these ideas, um, which is which is to me the point of the art, not just the art itself, but to make the art a vehicle of these higher sort of philosophical concepts. And so with that, I can, with collage, I can get work out a lot faster um, to galleries too, from a financial standpoint, um, I can feed them a lot more work a lot faster than if I was trying to sit there and paint it and wait for dry time and stuff like that to happen with with oil paint. So those things um, heavily influence the mediums that I use uh, visually. Nah, that makes a lot. Like you said, get the work out faster and some that withstand time. You know, thousand years later. You know, um, yeah. Just one caveat is um, I'm also a, a master uh, gilder, um, so I I gild a lot. And gilding is the art of um, using gold leaf or precious metal. And so in my work now, I use uh, uh, a lot of times 23 karat gold, um, imported Italian silvers. I use uh, Japanese pewter, um, Chinese pewter. I try to use a lot of different um, uh, Italian aluminum, a lot of different. Uh, yeah, that's that's just referencing that piece right there. That 23 karat gold. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, was, it, it has 23 karat gold in it for sure. Yeah. Now, sometimes I'm a little bit. I, I will use um, imitation stuff um, sometimes as far as like the uh, backdrops and then I'll use um, as it gets closer to the, the viewer, 
I'll start using precious metal. And that's what I did in that particular piece that you showed. Yeah, most definitely not. Nah, that one definitely is a is a gem right there. You know, as he broke it down and everything, like I say, just looking at it, you know, is trying to put it together. But as he broke it down, it's like every piece of detail is, is just highly detailed. You know what's going on. Um, yeah, the, the idea is is that maybe after I'm gone, um, somewhere deep in the future, hopefully, you know, hopefully yeah. I'll be around for a while, but, um somebody will take the time or somebody will know what they're looking at and be like oh let me break down what this artist was trying to say and mm -hmm. to me that's why that's why you want to take the time to make sure that your art is packed full of of meaning and they and they and it's not just some uh visually stimulating piece of art right. it has some real depth to it yeah, I feel like, like you say, the just visually pleasing is just like, all right, it's only going to be like that for so long. But something mm -hmm. that has messages and, and stuff that can be taken from it, it withstand everything that comes past that, you know. Uh, I look at music. Like a beautiful woman. Way. Yeah. Yep, or, or music. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I look at music the same way. Like, if they got messages or something, in, like, I'm, I'm the type of person that like to listen to music where, I can take something from it. Like if it just sound good, or I like the beat, it's just only gonna come and go. You know, it's like, all right, I'm gonna like it then on to the next. But you got timeless music where Michael Jackson the last beyond his time. The <laughs> Tupac right. music just hit three billion streams after the CD right. era. It's just like stuff like that are always be around to go back to reference to, or either a remake will come that still keeps it alive, you know. And even yep. the artistry, how artists, I hear artists redoing other pieces or grabbing ideas maybe from other pieces that inspire. I know inspiration comes from everywhere, you know, but you'll have artists that recreate, you know, bring stuff back. Just like everything else, movies, remakes, and, you know, but like I said, original, again, never be better than the original, you know? Yeah, and that's what you feel, that's what this culture now feels like. It feels like we've reached some point or some shifting um, benchmark where now everything, it just feels like there's a collapse of meaning. And I feel like the economy of the future is going to be the people who can bring meaning to people. Because if everything's generated uh, with AI oh, now man. and all of this <laughs> AI work is artwork is generated, AI music, if you ever listen yeah. to like Chill Hop or on, uh, on, on YouTube or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just, it's it like instrumentals. And there's like oh. some great little instrumentals that'll just play for like an hour and a half. All of that's AI instrumentals. AI, oh, AI, AI tell you, yeah. Yeah. AI so is dangerous, just, man. <laughs> whew. Well, it, I don't know how uh, it is dangerous. Yes. Yeah. I don't know how much more dangerous it is than anything else because everything right. has <laughs> a dual component to it, you know? Um, so I don't use AI necessarily in my artwork, and I really don't like AI-generated um, art in general, but I do understand the idea that evolution isn't slowing down for anybody right. to, <laughs> for, for you to just like, take a break, you know, or to be like, whew, like, you know, take a, oh, and then you take a breather. Like mm -hmm. the horse was, the horse replaced, you know, the basically feet. Yeah, um, and then the car replaced cars. Them. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trains replace the cars, and, yeah. and the planes uh, replace the trains. Mm -hmm. nah, that's just the way. That's that's the nature of evolution. It makes you think, like you know, watching Back to the Future and all that. How they did that futuristic thing and stuff. It's just like you know, reality is just like looking at the the time span from like the eighties, nineties to. You know, when you get to the millennials, what they was talking about what's going on. And now you got AI, and it's just, it's, just, it's just, like you say, it's keep evolving. And I already mm -hmm. feel like they already had this technology already. Like they just, whenever they felt like releasing it, you know. But I feel like it always was kind of already going on. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They definitely had a lot of the the technology that we use and we know and love today. 
they had it for a long time before they released it to the public. And, uh, and we wondered to ourselves, like, why is the average black family 200 years behind the average white family economically? And we have no idea that, yeah, they've had their hands on all of this technology and we don't know where any of this stuff comes from, where electricity comes from. We don't, we don't know. We don't know where our medicine is coming from. We don't know where these groceries are coming from. Right. We have no idea where these ga- where the gas, we, we pump the gas, we pay for unleaded or whatever, <laughs> and keep going our way. We don't know where, the, you know, where none of this stuff is coming from. And it's because they've had access to all of this technology mm-hmm. that we don't necessarily um, have access to until they've used it and they've set it up. And so by the time they introduce it to you, yeah. they're ready to monetize it at that point. And they're ready to make money off of it. And if you look at every holiday and all of our social, all of our social traditions in this country, all of them involve giving white people money. Yeah, fact. whether it's Christmas, <laughs> whether it's Valentine's, whether it's Easter, whether Man, it's Fourth of July, history, whether it's Thanksgiving, yeah, yeah, Black History Month, whatever no. it is you want to say, it involves giving white people money, and that means that's because they've had time to sit back strategize before they release this technology out to the public you know what one holiday that everybody should have paid attention to and definitely agree like okay yeah i see what's going on was when juneteenth when they started trying to monetize off that and they was wide in the open about it like we're gonna start selling juneteenth uh you know everything paraphernalia anything they can sell Yep, yeah. yep, that's exactly that's, that's a great point. No, like man, hold on, this ain't real, man. They just trying to like they, you know, they they put the holiday or whatever, so you know, all right, we'll give you all that, but we're gonna make money off of this, you know. You're gonna make money off of it. <laughs> yep. So by the time you get it, it's already set up to transfer money out of your wallet to their wallets from your account to their accounts. Yeah, man. So could you share some examples of how your artwork artwork challenges societal norms or beliefs? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I don't have access to kind of show any particular art, but um, if uh, you went back to that page you were at before. Uh, the mixed media or the one before that? There's uh, one on my website that says, um, that says, um, Got mixed Fresh media. Off the artist and, easel. Oh yeah, yeah. That's why I was at. Okay, yeah. Right First here. option. Gotcha. And if you scroll uh, down, yeah. If you scroll down a little bit, um, and I'll tell you when to stop. It shouldn't be much further. Just keep going. Keep going. It's a little bit more. Right here. Okay, oh, right so here. those two pieces. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about yeah, it. So, yep. Um, that particular piece is called um, Nine Ether Beans. Mm. Well, actually, that particular piece is called um, uh, Icarus. But it consists of the Nine Ether Beans. The, the one below it is um, definitely called Nine Ether Beans. Yeah. Man, but you got to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you start talking about societal norms, um, right. Dr. Frances Cress Wilson, uh, in her book, The ISIS Papers, she was heavily influenced by another really deep thinker that's still around with us. His name is uh, Neely Fuller. Um, but uh, he was really big on this idea of understanding the why, because he said, if you can understand the why, you can almost deal with any what and any how. And so he wrote this whole book. I can't remember the title right off the top of my head, but um, really deep brother. He really wanted to understand why were white people racist towards black people? Like why did why are we have forced to live like we're living behind enemy lines on this land? Now, well, he ended up class coming up. Citizen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like fourth class citizens. Actually. Yeah, basically, yeah, because um, if you talk about all the other ethnicities but yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah but we help build all of this stuff right and so um this particular piece sort of deals with that 
Um, because what he said was, was that if Martin Luther King's dream ever came to fruition and white people and black people ever could coexist with each other and co-mingle with each other in any real significant way, what will happen is genetically is the extinction of the white race because a mm. black man and a white woman creates a brown baby. If a white man and a black woman procreate, it creates a brown baby. And so all of those brown babies being born, the only way that they could stay in power and stay in control is to separate themselves, whether that's um, socially or economically. Um, and so you start to understand why white people were racist. And so now when you're dealing with the high, with the how and you're dealing with the what, you have the knowledge now of the why they're doing that because they're afraid of racial annihilation. They don't want to, to be wiped off the face of the earth as a subspecies. And so mm -hmm. their reaction to that has been to dominate everything and to dominate us with all of this code and they control our reality in terms of the meanings of the words that we use to define our reality. And that's why they have you in school for 12 years to beat that into your head um, and to make sure that they're on top and you stay on the bottom. I was just looking at um, Paw Patrol with my son. Right. So if you ever watch Paw Patrol, yeah, little, uh, yeah, cartoon. Yeah. yeah, but I was just looking at that. There's a little white boy named uh, Ryder on yeah. Paw Patrol. Yeah, and Ryder, regardless of what, he's the motherfucker in charge, right? And all the little dogs are running around trying to listen to what Ryder's telling them. They they always got to go to Ryder to get the yeah. understandings of things. So what that does is to a little black boy or to a little black girl is, is when they look at that, they subconsciously digest this idea that white people are the authority, and that's who you're supposed to look to for leadership. You know, even in Christianity, when you start thinking about the the white Jesus, um, there's a whole generation of, of baby oh, boomers yeah. that that were you know bought hook, line, and sinker. This idea of this white Jesus. I I grew up with a white Jesus on yeah. the cross in my in my hallway, and there uh, we would look at you know every day, every morning before we went to school, we'd see this little white Jesus on the wall. And we had to pass by, and so um, um, this particular piece is it kind of uh, counterbalances that. And you'll see a lot of little black babies um, in like on the buildings. Um, and you'll see these huge chicken heads, which are cocks. Oh, right, and yeah. So mm. the idea is, is that they can cock their weapons and they can shoot us with their pistols like Dirty Harry. Um, but we can also cock our weapons and shoot them and annihilate them off the earth um, using our weapon, which is our DNA, which is our genetics. Facts. And so, Facts. Yeah. And so that's what you'll see in this particular Facts. piece to answer your uh, initial question. Um, you'll see our, our black cocks taking over the world. Yeah. Now, nah, and that's crazy that you say that, man, because like I said, I'm glad I asked this question because this topic, you know, where you see like kind of like you kind of see it right now where you see like a, a how can I say uh ethnicity kind of panicking because I, I can tell like that's why they're letting everybody in all this type mm -hmm. of stuff because they was already putting in articles about being the minorities and they tried to flip it and make it seem like we the minorities, we really my majority though, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, all, all of that stuff gets murky. I don't know, yeah. you know, where those lines are, but I can pretty much guarantee you that whatever they told us is not the accurate version of what's really happening. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm really slow to believe what the popular narrative is. As a matter of fact, usually whatever the popular narrative is, I my instinct is to look the opposite. They telling me to look right, they tell everybody to look right. <laughs> I think it's the look now. <laughs> <laughs> Facts, no, really, because it's like when, like you say, if the, the I ain't gonna well, but the leader of the country come out now and say something, I'm more to ask questions of why this is going a certain way or what's going on. Like everything, like you said, is a question thing. Now. You know, it's like 
you know, let me look more and you know, uh, put some stuff together behind this because it's really just like you know, they put their word out there and they word is they word because they word been like that since the beginning of the time. So we see it. As yep, yep, <laughs> yep, um, yep. And, and you even think about um, like now they're trying to censor TikTok and, yeah. and they've already been censoring Instagram and Facebook. And you know, yeah, we got all hit a good this, time. <laughs> I bet I can only imagine. And yeah. so that this right now they want to control the narrative because the only way white supremacy exists is it exists in denial. It exists in the state of us just basically looking the other way. We can't really ever talk about what you did to the Indians and how you wiped them off the land all, Man, all together. And there, I know there's a lot of debate on whether yeah, yeah, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah. But, but we, mean, don't, we don't talk wanna, about that. Yeah, I just want to say paper genocide. That's all I want to put on it. I just put paper genocide behind a lot of Exactly. Things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You just change the definition. Again, you change the code, and all of a sudden, a whole yeah, group of people that were, yep, that were already here, all of a sudden now just become, you know, oh, they were slaves and blah, blah, blah. Like, no, you know, these black people, who were already here on this land. We're indigenous to this land. Um, you know, even the, the Native Americans that we consider like Indians, supposedly, you know, those Five people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, I, I see where you're hitting that. I see you on know, your Dean, your Dean Callaway and all of that. Man, man, it just it just makes you look at everything different because you you question too why are we the only group of people that's been changed numerous times, like. They stay white the whole time. We've been called everything <laughs> that you can think of. That's yep, crazy. Yep. Even black, even when you think about it, like black, your skin isn't black. You know, you're brown um, and, exactly. and beige. Um, white people aren't aren't uh, white. They're pink and orange, you know. And, and a, season, a really, yeah. So th these ideas that they use to um, manipulate us once you actually understand the why and understand what they're doing, it's like all of a sudden the world opens up to you like a flower. Man. Like, oh, <laughs> this is what's going I've been waiting my whole life to hear that. Oh, man. I can't cut, I can't not stop seeing it now because everything new, I, I keep seeing stuff that's already happened, that's already, the information has already been there. But now that it's coming out, that I'm finding out later, it's just like I can't cut it off because there's more information gonna keep coming. Like that part of it, because it's like, like you say, you've been trying the program for 12 years, and they don't want, you know, the adults. They don't want us because our minds are already where it's at. But they want to get the, you know, they get them at a young age. You know, yeah. that's how they do it. Because <laughs> you can even subconsciously. Go ahead. You even know I heard you. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, like, you know, because you get the kids or whatever, even when you're thinking about sending your child to school and stuff, it's like, you know, it's like your kids really not your if your kid don't come to the institution, we're gonna send uh, you know, truancy out of you're gonna go to cause you need to send them here to our schools. Like it's crazy, hey, man. Think about this. No species in the history of animals on this planet has ever sent their offspring off to their known documented predators for education. <laughs> Imagine a, a sheep giving its little sheep offspring off to the wolves to go to school to learn how to be a sheep. Or imagine a, a, a tree um, going to um, a chainsaw or an ax for, to try to understand who it is, you know, like, yeah, that we're the only species that imagine a gazelle going to a lion, putting this little baby lions, oh, baby gazelles in a lion school to learn how to be a gazelle. <laughs> and, and it ends up being where now it's so pervasive and so clandestine and so um, nuanced to where when you look at a, a movie on television, and you let's say it's vampire, it's some sort of vampire, whatever character that you're watching, and this is pure Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and Neely Fuller. All of those things are normally super dark. So a vampire 
it's got on this huge um, black cape or this black suit or mm. some big black monster or some big black fog or 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 orc or mm. something like that that's happening some big dark thing that's coming out of the darkness that's the white man's subconscious that he puts and he plays out in movies where basically it's that again that racial annihilation they're, they're going to come out of the dark and scream you know it used to be the little little ugly little skull face but it was dressed with the black hoodie and all of this stuff yeah and would come out of the come out of the closet and, and kill a little white girl and stab it and that's him working out his subconscious of being racially and annihilated this big black man which i'm six foot seven <laughs> and i'm dark skinned with a black beard and a, a, a deep voice um if i walked into a boardroom and sat down with them all of the all of them would sit up and you know, adjust the seats and, you know, and look at me to a certain degree through that lens of not wanting to be racially annihilated because they know that we have the dominant um, genetics and they have, um, uh, I can't remember the, the correct term for it, um, but it, it's a, a, a secondary version of the of the of yeah the like a yeah yeah like a uh I, I get what you, I, I get where you're going with it. I can't remember it. it's a it's a uh it's a correct a word DNA. for it it's right at the tip yeah, of my tongue yeah. I, can't, I can't remember uh basically like a copycat DNA and not no full you know like human well, we like, were the original we were the original man yeah you know so when you start thinking about God creating man in his image which was in the Bible and as far as you can go back, the original man was a black man. So then if that's the case, then everybody else is a derivative of that initial um carbon copy. Carbon copy. Yep. They got yep. Carbon copy DNA. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. It, yeah, it's it just it's it's a lot of ways to go with it. I ain't want to get too much off, but yeah, that's that, <laughs> that's a whole another episode, man. Like that's right, deep. right. It's deep, man, because like you say, the fault is just coming to a false reality now. Like, you know, okay, this is like you say, we're indigenous to this land, but then it's just like, like you say, it's the why. Like, how did this, you know, because I got a son, I'm ready, and it's like, he going to ask me these questions, but when you saying like, I know he got to go through the system, I know all this stuff going on, so it's like, I got to re-educate him and stuff. Like, I don't, I feel like, uh you know, now that I'm, I'm, I would say it would be, you know, at one point in time, it's like, if you don't know, like, you know, it's the ignorance, you know, when you know, it's like them not knowing us, they ignorant to us in a way, because like you say, they get these false perceptions of the stereotypes and all that type of stuff. Like, you know, if you are a black man going so well in the area where it's predominantly them, they get ignorant to the fact that, like you say, that subconscious and everything kicks in. It's like, it's just crazy our society, you know, how they, you know, kind of brainwash society in a way uh, and what they're kind of yeah, feeding we'll, people. We, we'll never know what it feels like to drag an elephant home or a, a hippo home to the village and every, and feed the whole village. We'll never know what it, our versions of success right. based on their coding is being able to ball out, you know what I'm saying, or, or being able to afford these different um uh -huh. economic uh, benchmarks in their worlds yeah but we'll yeah. we'll never know what that feels like as a black man to actually be um in i won't say we'll never know let me back that up right but a lot of black men have lived and died never understanding what that would feel like and again even in our most innermost moments that we have conversations with ourselves we're still talking to ourselves in our the oppressors um language and hit through his value system yeah because like you say in their value system i was doing a research the other day and i was like let me think it was like it's like 22 point something million millionaires in the united states and only like two million of them are black and there was like right. it's 492 billionaires in the united states only nine of them were black so when you think about it, it's like when you go keep going up this level you're not you starting to be in the same rooms with these people you realize i guess it's in the sense of they kind of i wouldn't say i would say give in like it's just like all right i'm a part of you guys now like i'm trying to because it's you still gotta work your way up you gotta be 
you got to please them in a way, like to be in the room with them. And like you say, mm -hmm. we wouldn't know what it feels like to bring the elephant on where it's like, boom, there's nothing side attached to this. This is like, it's all me. It came from all me. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I feel that. Yep. Now, all, all the kids and the babies cheering you along, knowing that they're getting ready to eat their fresh meat yeah. or getting ready to eat this fresh harvest. You know, you, you've cultivated land that you own and that you, you grow um, your, uh, your uh, fruit or bear your fruit, um, you know, to, for your village. Like there's, there's no comparison to that. You know, when you start talking about real wealth right. and, and that's what I think we have to kind of unlearn. I'm not suggesting that when I say unlearn, I'm not suggesting that we totally detach from their system because they, they do have something. I like the internet. You know, I like my Xbox. I love Madden and, you know, everything yeah. <laughs> like, like everybody else. But, you know, I do understand that all of those things are rabbit holes. And if I invest too much time and energy into those rabbit holes mm -hmm. as opposed to staying on what my purpose is. And again, not being distracted by the devil, um, really tapping into my cosmic evolution. Um, then I'm, I'm doing the devil's job for him. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the, I feel like when you speak of, you know, from a spirit's apart, the devil is like too much dopamine. Like there's too much dopamine, too much feel good. And then, like you say, you sidetrack because you feel good doing this. But this might be a challenge over here. But this might just gonna take you to a whole another level. But it takes some hard work behind it. And I feel like whatever we do is always gonna be that type of challenge because you gotta feel uncomfortable to keep you know moving. Sometimes like you know it's like all right if it's too easy, give yourself a challenge. You know, like take on right. the challenge. You know, and yeah, like. But you know how? What else it, are like, you here for? Yeah. Like we, we what else, you're not here. You weren't born to just pay bills and to just be an <laughs> economic vehicle for somebody else. You know right. what I'm saying? Like right. you're here to actually learn something and to live an actually valid human existence. And if you are caught up in all of these different rabbit holes, even like consciousness, even the black power struggle, that's right. another rabbit hole that you can live your whole life going down and never actually do the shadow work to know thyself mm. and to me that's what i try to communicate in my art that's real brother um so what so speaking of your art like what challenges if any do you face as an artist and philosopher you know working within the realm of you know social commentary and uh afrofuturism or is it just like like you say you're you're a multi-disciplinary multi artist, so you fit kind of everywhere, wherever you need it. That's what it sounds like to me. You can kind of, you can go in one area or you can go over here. It's like you can, you can basically camouflage yourself comedian. You know, you can go and work wherever, you know. Yeah, that, that actually having a multi-disciplinary approach um, mm -hmm. to my philosophy uh, creatively has been a huge asset to me in terms of the way I've been able to move, because if one thing is lukewarm, one thing is cold and one thing is hot, I can move towards the thing that's lukewarm and hot and come back to the thing that's cold when it warm. You know, you can bounce around without um, ever having to have your name outside of the conversation. Like your name is still going to be in the conversation somewhere, but it morphs depending on what's happening in, in, the, in that moment in time. Um, so there's there's that um, component of it. And can you can you re ask that question for me again? I'm sorry, just, just refresh uh, me. Yeah, so when it, um, let me see how I was at. <laughs> um, so basically, um, I'm a little too far. Yeah, take your time, brother. I just want to make sure I, I don't not uh, answer your question. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I was here. Okay. So, yeah, when it kind of like difficulties faced with, um, Difficult. you know, with situations throughout your journey, like, you know, was, well, I think I don't know. I asked you that one already. <laughs> no, I, I remember now what you asked about the difficulties. And what mm -hmm. I will say um, at a glance is, is that. 
Oh, it, what artists. challenges? What challenges you face? You know, what because like the type of work, the type of work that you're doing, you know, in the sense too, like say Af Afrofuturism, you know, as an artist yeah. and being a philosopher, like pushing your message, like you know, artists. Artists are not the same the interesting space okay because um black people as a whole don't buy original black art like I i'll ask you just you know for shits and giggles how much original black art do you have on your house probably hey. not a lot we might hey. guess I, I would tell you I got one piece. I'm not going to even cap. I, I got one piece. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you interesting. I'm going to tell you an interesting story behind it. Hold on. Let me see if I can grab it. All right. No doubt. Yeah. I'm going to tell you an interesting piece. Oh, oh, you can't see it. All right. Hold on. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of pixelated. Yeah, it's pixelated, but you know, you can see the faces. Yep. So, wow. Uh, yeah, okay, Evander. They go, Evander. I see but, you. All right, I, I tell you an interesting uh, thing behind that, though. So, like, this artist, like, I'm one of them type of people, like, I support my people, you know, and um, so that, that artwork I actually came across, like, kind of like out and about, and uh, the guy he was homeless, so I'm looking at it. You know, because I'm looking at the quality of it, and I think he said, "Uh, it's it's like a piece of wood. It's not even um, yeah, it's basically a piece of wood, and I think this might be like oil paint or somewhere somehow." But uh, nah, I can't really. Okay, but yo, yeah, yeah, it's kind of yeah distorted. But uh. When he was telling me about it, I'm like, man, I was sitting there looking at it like, man, this look like it's worth some money or whatever. And I said, how much you want for it? And he was like, five. He was like, five dollars. I'm like, five dollars? Like, that's how much you, you know, but he homeless at the same time. But the brother right. talented. So I'm like, I just gave, I gave him more when he asked for it, but I took it like, you know, is it being, like I say, original piece of work? Like, and the way it looks, like, you see it in person, I showed a couple people and like, I tell them like, how much you think I paid for this? And they'll say a way large amount. Cause like I say, the worth is based on how people consume it and you know, whatever they can see from it and stuff like that. But like I said, I was like that, that right though, like it ain't, you know, $1,000, but like the worth and value of seeing it, you know, and how I look at it is it's way worth more than that. You know, it spoke to you. It spoke to yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. It, it, Cause it's so, like a, it's like a story behind it in a sense, you know. Because like I say, this guy at home or whatever. But it's like, like I say, it, you know, it don't matter. Like you say, take the money out of it, you know, everything out of that. Take the homeless fact out of it, everything like that. It's like the end of the day, he human, I'm human. When you strip a person of everything, stuff like that, he's get like it's it's the connection to it, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? And and that's one of the things I try to educate black people on because black artists are in this little purgatory where um, we aren't celebrated by black people. Black people don't buy our art generally. Most of my clients who really actually buy my art are white, just keeping yeah. it a buck. So, um, but at the same time, there's a 6.4 billion with a B, not million, but B, art in art uh, ecosystem Mm. That black people are not really participating in. We represent maybe two percent of a six point six point four billion dollar art industry. So if we're representing two percent of that, then that is some super minuscule amount of all of these transactions that are happening um, uh, globally in the art world that we aren't participating in, and most of that's done by white people and so black people don't support us on the low end white people don't necessarily support us on the high end so we're right in this little purgatory in the middle where we have to kind of keep ourselves motivated and keep ourselves going um be until maybe we become popular enough so that black people can say to themselves 
as opposed to buying this, this Birkin bag or this coach bag or whatever the case may be, I'm going to invest in black art, you know, or until white folks discover black art to a certain degree and feel like they want to start dumping money into it because they, I guess they got so much money, they don't have nothing else to do. But until then, we're in this purgatory where we can't go to hell or heaven. And we kind of just got to stay in this space um, and still try to be creative and, and productive. And that's an interesting place to be uh, as an artist. That's why, to me, you have to have some sort of guiding star, some kind of philosophy that is all encompassing, that's larger than your specific art practice that you can submerge yourself in and dissolve yourself in and realize that um, if you never become this huge um, art phenom, if you always remain the underdog, um, that's all right because you passed it, you, you went as far as you could go and you passed the baton to another artist and now he's got to run this next length. But you stood strong and you stood true and you held the line. And, um, and to me, you know, as an artist, sometimes that might be the, the best thing you can expect in life, you know, but you did your job. No, most definitely. Like, I feel like, you know, like you say, I think it's a trend thing with our people. You know, if somebody just, you know, how they how they use our figures to, you know, I guess for a monetary game, you know, we should be able to do it for each other in a sense, you know, and not have wait on them to do it. Because like I said, it was a trend starting where, Cause we got the money. I feel like all of us as a whole got the money. Like we got the when you look at the uh the spending power of how we spend money, but it's just a it circles, but it lead it's like having a gap in the circle. It don't fully close, mm -hmm. so it's going to everybody <laughs> else. It don't revolve around, right? That's a fact. You know? So, but now nah, I definitely feel like you know that's that's one of the things that will help. But I'm like I know we got the money, like, but it's just not revolving with us well the the thing about it is now i'll say this and then i let you move on to your next question but the right. thing about it is, is that black people are so talented so we're so talented that we take it for granted and so we don't support each other because you you know you know 10 other niggas that know how to draw or that know how to sing or that know how to dance or know how to do something so every black person has got all of this rich talent inside of them that goes undiscovered so because of that we don't value we see it as so abundant that we don't value it the same way uh the other the, the dominant society values it with their artists because they aren't as rich and bountiful in all of these talents and all these gifts they can't do a 360 windmill and do all the stuff that we come up with and, and hit records and all this stuff that just comes out of us easily and so they value it and they put a, a nice price tag on it yeah. when their people do it. But we don't value it because it's something that's innately um, embedded in us as a people. Yeah, I feel that too, brother. Most definitely. Um, but yeah, like, like you know, I feel like, you know, again, like a trend, they got to, somebody got to take the lead. Somebody got to just show it. It's, this the right way to go with it, you know, rather than going the other direction, like, hey, no, you turn and let's go this way so we can, you know, keep climbing up the ladder together, you know? Yeah. Um, so how do you envision the evolution of Afro Afrofuturism and its impact on society in the coming years? Well, um, Afrofuturism is a mixture of um, mysticism, uh, spirituality, um, technology. Um, it's also uh, has components um, of our collective past, all kind of mashed together um, into this art form that with any luck, and this is one of the things that I really focus on from a curatorial standpoint, um, I, I, created this exhibition called The Next Hundred Years. And The Next Hundred Years is what I, I've told the press multiple times in different interviews. It's a fine arts vision board. It's like they tell you to create a vision board for what you want to see in the future. 
this whole exhibition with all of these dope artists, every piece you see on the wall, it's a fine, it's a collection of fine art that's a vision board for how we want to see ourselves in the next hundred years. And so I challenge the artists to, to say, like, yo, if you if you want to see a utopia for us, if you want to see black people working together, if you want to see black people loving each other, then create that artwork. And then let's put this up on the on the walls and make this our make this whole exhibition our fine arts vision board for what we want to see in the future. And so that's that's how I um, uh, attempt to use Afrofuturism in particular to kind of um, hijack the narrative for us. Um, I'm also working on um, creating a time capsule. So what I want to do is 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 get a grant where I get a time capsule and um, something that's airtight and that will probably stand the test of time for another 100 years. And have all of these artists put a piece of artwork into this time capsule and actually literally have it buried and have a date for opening reception for somebody to dig this work up 100 years from now and, and have that work on display and then start to do the back read the back engineering or the reverse engineering to find out who all of these artists were who donated to that this time capsule man that's gonna be that's gonna be that that's gonna be it right there like that's it that's the idea man uh now definitely and then like you say for the next hundred years the people that dig that or they might that might be something they want to you know or whatever or they might it just depends on what the future holds but it's, it's mm -hmm. more so gonna be like you know, whatever, you know, the next hundred years look like, whatever, that's going to be able to tell what was going on, like how they want to tell us stuff all the time. They got the art, but a lot of stuff with our history is always by way of art. Most of the time. Right. When they talk about right. it's by art. <laughs> you know, it's really not no physical, you know, but that that's going to be it right there. Nah, that's definitely Yeah. It. Even the show that you came to was called uh, uh, Black Future Month. Yeah. As opposed to us talking about Black History Month, I, I turned it on its head and mm -hmm. called it Black Future Month. You know, so that's that's look forward instead of looking back at the trauma of the past. If a if a woman is raped violently, what good is it to constantly talk to her about how she was being raped? Every year you're gonna talk to her and remind her about how she was assaulted. And penetrated and raped and beat up and whatever the case mm -hmm. may be and left for dead every February you're just gonna keep reminding her about that no, no how about just turn that on its head and use this reminder as a as a vehicle to look forward instead of looking backward and to imagine a better future as opposed to just rehashing this traumatic past yeah nah that sounds like america to me for sure man because when you said that i'm like yeah because growing up like i always remember every time february come around it was a reminder it's like what was going on and all that like as a child like keep talking about you know the same stuff or how hard it was for us you know when it you know it could have it could have really been something else but through y'all like his story it was like this and y'all want to keep mm -hmm. saying it like keep doing it over and over or when they re uh color per when they remix the movies, keep all of the all <laughs> of these slave movies, dude. I don't watch any slave. I just posted that on Facebook a, a while ago. I was like, "Yo, I'm I will never watch another slave movie." Yo. They tricked me with a few. They've gotten so slick with it because they they realize that there's a group of people now who don't want to watch slave movies anymore. So now they've intertwined. They've twisted it to where now you're watching stuff like um them on uh mm. on amazon or um lovecraft lovecraft country yeah, which yeah. i actually do like yeah but, lovecraft, um yeah. then they know, stopped they stopped yeah. it though right yeah yeah they stopped it because at the end of it the, the, the black man became god mm. so they had to stop that immediately <laughs> but the, the, the vehicle for us seeing this black man become god began with them showing us how um, Regina King had to deal with all of these racist kind of um, yeah. neo Ku Klux Klan members that she was dealing with. And so all of that stuff has a slave vibration. It might not be an exact slave narrative, 
but it's got a slave vibration. And what that vibration does is, is it trans it, it transmits to your subconscious, which is below your conscious mind. Your subconscious is is connecting to these ideas that white people are here and that they control everything and that black people are here and we just react and respond to everything. And, and that's what those slave movies are designed. That's even why you on social media, you'll see um, uh, uh, black men getting shot down and, you know, oh, getting man. handcuffed by police and all of this stuff. They want to try to communicate that to you. But that's I not by accident. <laughs> But I get censored when I want to talk about five dollar Indians and y'all doing this paperwork. That's real. Come on, come on. <laughs> but they want to always flag me because we get to talking real. But y'all can show people dying on fate, and they're like, "Nah, that ain't cool." Like, Damn. just because I, I want to. Like Orlando Castile. Yeah, you yeah. you remember that yeah. man when yeah. the, the dude shot him in front of his Minna, baby mama Minnesota. and the baby? Yeah. 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 yeah, that's when it really clicked to me. I was just like, oh. They trying to do the same thing. It was like lynching. They, they would take the biggest buck in the slave um, uh, community, um, castrate him, hang him up on a tree, mm. burn him, and leave him up there for like six weeks and let the, the birds pick at his body. And it normally would be on the path that the black people would have to go to to go to the well or go to the water hole. So every day the women would have to pass by that because they were getting water to go back and forth and they'd have to smell it. They'd have to see the flies and they'd have to swat at them and, and see this person decomposing. And what that did was was subconsciously communicate to them, um, oh, I don't want this to happen to my son. So I'm going to beat that out of him before the slave master even has a chance to, of doing this to him. You know, if I see him get the slightest bit of counter um, uh, 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 rejecting what the slave master is feeding I'm us. Trying to rebel him, yeah. I'm a beat, yeah, rebelling against it. I'm yeah. a beat that out of him because I I couldn't have fathomed passing him for six months being eaten up by maggots, and so that's the Willie Lynch syndrome, and that's what they mm. started doing later on with social media, where you yeah. start seeing Mike Brown and Lando Castile and all these different people say her name and all this other stuff on your social media feed. That's literally modern day right there. Literally, like, like I say, it's cool when they want to run the clips and like that on social media, but just spreading awareness. So I say a certain thing or try to like my people. Y'all want to say, just take it. And I think I got a couple things took down for posting clips. Either was it James Baldwin, Dick Gregor, or something like that, and flag like for what? <laughs> Crazy. Yep. Yep. Um. So how how do you see? Well, we already talked about that kind of in a way, but how do you see your art contributing to the uh, preservation and celebration of the culture? You know, for the future. Yeah, man. If if I have my way, um, you know, again, I I do pretty well. In all honesty, I make a decent living um, off of my art. Uh, I feel like now. I'm in a space where people really value what it is that um, I have to say, uh, both philosophically and artistically. And so I've done well in that regard, to be quite honest. You know, I, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but I make a, a decent living off of my craft. And so that was always very important to me to get to that particular um, summit of the mountain where I could at least breathe a little bit and feel good, you know, to, to know that my artwork is, is sustaining me and helping me to feed my family. Um, but so outside of that, as the, as the floor, the ceiling for me would be for my work to be collected in museums and for people to, um, you know, write books about what it is and I'm talking about and to see me as a, a visionary and to see me as a a, a, a mystical kind of um, shaman, you know, who use his art mediums to get people to tap into who they were on a basic level. You know, the, the word person means mask. 
in Sanskrit. So Sanskrit was one of the original languages. So um, the word person in Sanskrit actually means mask. So our ideas that we have about each other are just these representatives, just these masks that we wear. And hopefully my work will help people to take those masks off and to deal with each other in a more uh, true and authentic way. Nah, most definitely. Nah, that's definitely some, you know, like I say, to, to push them on the journey of knowing ourselves, you know, like your work will push that, you know, for people to see things for what they are. Um, so any upcoming projects or events you will be curating, you would like to share? Or you'll be a cur curator? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curating a, an exhibition, again, called The Next 100 Years. It's with uh, another incredible artist named Tracy Morell. Um, that will be um, coming late summer. I don't have the exact date because there's a few things, uh, moving parts. So I don't want to give a date on the show and then it, that not be the exact date. But stay tuned. Um, you can always go to renswork.com, R-E-N-S-W-O-R-K.com um, for more information about uh, that exhibition. But my um, my gut is that it will be late summer early fall and so hope i'll definitely let keep you in the loop about when that exhibition is um but i'm also working on several solo shows that i have coming up uh i have um, a solo show coming up at mason fine art which is called um letters to deja and my i have an estranged daughter her name is deja from an ex um an ex-wife of my or a marriage um, in my past. And when her and I split, her mom and I split, um, we lived in two different states and I was never able to really get these philosophical ideas or impart them to her. And so a lot of a lot of the women in my artwork over time, I started to realize I was like, Wow, like I do a lot of black women doing really powerful things or coming into their power. And I started to understand, I was like, wow, these these images are actually letters that are conversations that I always wished I, I could have had with my daughter. And so um my solo show is called uh Letters to Deja, and um it will be basically an open letter to my daughter visually, um, in conversations that I wish that I had had with her, but um, instead I'm having them with the world. And um, I'm actually gonna invite her to uh, this exhibition even, and specifically because it has her name in it. And I'm actually even including mm -hmm. different images of her that I found online um, in the artwork so that she really can feel that. And I wanna publicly apologize to her for not being in her life. and. Um, and to hopefully set us off on a on a new trajectory for the rest of mine anyway. Nah, that'll be big, man. Definitely. Um, that that'll be here in Atlanta too. Yeah, yeah. Mason Fine Art is in uh, Miami Circle. Okay. So that'll be here in Atlanta. And I'll keep you too. I'll keep you posted on on when that'll be as well. That's what I'm creating work for actively right now. Yeah, man. Nah, that's gonna definitely go good, man. Um. So any any special recognitions or shout outs you would like to give to those who've been supporting you along the way on your journey? Oh yeah, gosh, man. Um, okay, so I, I won't go into individuals because mm -hmm. there's always gonna be somebody that you forget, right? Right. Or, and that might feel some type of way because their name wasn't called. What I will say is, is that what shows up for me mostly in my life has always been the sacred feminine, the goddess. And so that goddess has, has been behind the faces of a lot of different women in my life who have come in, my, have just been there right at the right time when shit was getting ready to hit the fan or when I really needed some guidance in some kind of way or really needed a counsel or a, a, a breast or a shoulder to lean my head on. Um, 
just to rest as a black man living behind enemy lines. And so um, I tell multiple women in my life, from my mom to my my girlfriend, even sometimes even when I see my daughter making posts and stuff on on TikTok or um, um, you know just different women that I've dealt with in my life. Um, mm -hmm. I'll tell them that I hear you and I hear the guidance you're giving me on an individual level, but I also hear the goddess, the feminine principle in nature speaking through you. And so um, I want to recognize the feminine um, principle in nature. And that that's who I would, I would say has always kept me, you know, to a certain degree. Nah, facts, you know, like even speaking of like, I like how you project, you know, the black woman in the art and everything like that, you know, because the, the, how can I say it? The, uh, I basically say the script got to be flipped from showing like how the, the black woman is being portrayed and all that through the media or history and all that type of stuff. Like it got to be another, you know, that's not it for real. If you right. want to tell the real story from the real people. It's another way we got our own way of showing the imagery, you know. Like yep. I'm just want to get away from letting other people show us what we should be like, or how it should look, or what our men look like to the, you know, it's all that type of stuff. Like what our women supposed to look like, what they do, and like it's just like nah, we like you say we got to get back to you know, really um, how can I say like you know building each other and, and you know really appreciating each other you know in a way on a like you say on a a goddess and and you know the king level we got to act as such you know if, if yeah and, and that goes for women too like they they it would behoove them to listen to the godhead in the men in their lives whether it's their fathers or their boyfriends or their husbands or even their sons or cousins or whoever it is that's in their life um, I'll go so far as to say there's a there is a um, idea in hermeticism, which hermeticism is a um, is a thought exercise that was supposedly started by um, this guy named uh, Hermes Trismegistus. That's the, uh, the Greek version of his name, but in um, in Egyptian mythology, his name was uh, Tehuti, and uh, or, or Thoth, um, or Thoth, um, T H O T H, who some people think is is the predecessor of thought itself from an etymology mm -hmm. standpoint. But um, there's this idea that there is a feminine principle in nature, and then there's a masculine principle in nature, and the a pencil, let's say, the shape of the pencil the eraser, the lead on the, the tip of it, the wood, the yellow um, paint on it, all of that is the masculine principle. That's how it appears in nature. But the feminine principle in nature is the poem that you write with it, or the song that you write with it, or the letter that you write with it, or the sketch that you draw with it. Um, a chair with four legs and a back and a seat, or whether it's wood or whether it's metal, whether it's got a cushion or not, you know, whether it's Art Deco or whether it's contemporary, whatever this, this chair is, mm -hmm. um, the physical representation of it is the masculine principle of it. Um, but the rest that you get out of it when you sit in it or the conversation mm -hmm. that you, you have in it, you know, um, whatever the, the use of it is, um, ultimately, um, whether you use it to change that light bulb, all of that is the feminine principle of it. You know, mm -hmm. um, lastly, a, a light bulb itself, um, the little question mark kind of shape of a light bulb um, with the little metal base of it. All of that is the glass and all of that is the, the masculine component of it. But the light and the illumination yeah. that you get out of it is the feminine principle of it. So you can look at mm -hmm. everything in nature based on these this universal law and you can see where the the masculine is always going to be the physical representation of what it is that you're dealing with. And the feminine component is always going to be the meaning or the purpose that you had it, that you get out of it. So what it is, is, is a marriage of form and function, 
form meets function. Everything that has a form has a function, and everything that has a function has a form. And that's um, the uh, hermetic principle of what's called the law of gender. And so if you can tap into that kind of thought process, you'll never be able to not see that. Like for the rest of your life, everything that you you touch, the spoon that you grab out of the mm -hmm. out of the drawer in the kitchen, you'll see that spoon and the shape of it and, and the, the, you know, all, the way that what it's made out of, um, that you recognize that as the masculine principle. Mm -hmm. But the food that you yeah. eat from it and the, you know, yeah. or the medicine that you take from it, you'll now yeah. understand that as the feminine component of it. And yeah. I think that's an important way um, to, to think about the world uh, in general from a philosophical standpoint, but it also definitely informs my art. I feel that man, you said a lot on that because it's just like, like you say, medicine, or whatever you know, the pill it'd be like the masculine, but the effect and the, the experience after that make you feel better is everything like the feeling of the presence of a woman, you know. Yep. I feel that yep. uh -huh. man, man is the form, woman is the function, yeah. Form mm -hmm. meets function. That's facts. Now, I learned something new to just make me look at it a different way, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what is something that you manifest for yourself before the year is out that you already see coming together? Um, you know, right now, so I I'm a visual artist, um, but I also work for another visual artist, like as far as like a day job, um, and this visual artist sells his paint. I signed the NDA, so I can't. Say who the artist is, but he sells mm -hmm. his paintings. For right now, we're working on a two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar art project for one woman's living room, and this is how you know he's a, a multimillionaire. And so, um, just being in that orbit and being in that proximity has taught me so much. And I've worked with him now for five years, and so. Um, you know, I've always done my thing on the side and I've always been been constantly working um, and building up uh, myself as a visual artist and as a, as a thought leader. And so by the end of this year, um, my, my truest desire is to be able to wake up in the morning and pour myself a cup of orange juice and not have to work in somebody else's studio. Now I make a good, I make a pretty nice living working for him, but it would be amazing to not have to do that to be able to be totally um, self autonomous, and and that's my vision for uh, the rest of the year is working towards that. Most definitely, man. And um, what what is the message you would like to leave for the coaching for those who are you know, aspiring artists on the rise? Um, just to be authentic, you know, be true to yourself. Again, know thyself. Everything else ultimately is a distraction. So if you get caught up in some rabbit hole and, and you realize that, you know, the, the, the ladder you've been climbing up this whole time, your entire life, um, you get to the top of it and you realize that it's up against the wrong wall. <laughs> you know, it's OK to get off of that ladder and do something different. That's more aligned with who you are. You know, what happens is, is people get up so high on that ladder to where they feel like it'll take too long for them to climb down. And they definitely don't want to jump off of it. because They don't want to kill themselves. <laughs> and, and they realize that they've been up against the wrong wall this whole time. And so the earlier in life that you can figure out what wall you need to put your ladder up against to climb, what is your, gonna be your purpose in life, um, what's gonna help you to know who you are as a spirit and as a soul, as a cosmic being in this realm, the better off you're gonna be um, for the rest of your life. And so that's what I would want to communicate to people. And one exercise that um, I've said to people that I think helps with that is to ask yourself, what would you die for? Like, what on this planet would you 
literally stand in front of a bullet for and literally lay down your life for? You know, what's that important to you? And whatever that thing is that you would die for, find a way to live for it. That's real. I felt that, man. Like you was talking, I felt you talking to me because it's like, man, <laughs> I done felt myself going up the ladder and like, but like you say, I haven't been, a, you know, to not be afraid to get down and, you know, like you say, figure out, all right, where to escape at. Like, because I'm touching the ceiling, but it's no way for me to get out of there, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, nah, I felt, I felt that, man. That was too real. Um, That's what's up, man. So, like I say, brother, it, it was definitely an honor to have you on here, man. You know, to take time out of your schedule, whatever, to kick it with the underdogs, you know, it's very much appreciated, you know. Uh, look forward to, you know, more major things to come out, you know, uh, come out from me, you know, and uh, look forward for the events, you know. And, you know, if I can make it there, I'm going to definitely, you know, make the 100 years. That That's going to be, that's the one right there. That's no out. Yeah, because I it's <laughs> yeah, I just the vision. Posted, it's the vision, man. Like, you know, I can visualize. I'm not really a, I'm a well, I do music, but like the visual part of it, I can see things as you know, when people are explaining it or look at art and kind of visualize what's going on, but just I just can't draw it. <laughs> but uh right, but yeah, like nah, this definitely was a dope conversation, man. Like Definitely all uh, look forward to everything coming out. Like I say, um, uh, you said everything happened for a reason. Like I say, for me coming out that day, I think that was the first day I kind of got back out, you know, because I think the last one I went to was a uh it was another exhibition at the future dead artist gallery. And uh I was like, Yeah, Santa told me to come out that day. I caught the last end of it, but it was just like, you know, still to come, you know, see all the work yeah. and everything like that, a couple familiar artists and stuff. So uh this is what we doing over here man we definitely uh pushing like we trying to move forward you know and instead of complaining about the culture just be the change you know uh season five over 100 and something episodes man so I'm just- congratulations <laughs> man i see the work you're putting in bro appreciate that man like i said it's I impressive like- man appreciate it you know i feel like everybody deserves this same highlight you know i'm not the type of person that you know, if I get on Instagram and see them blue checks, like I'm not looking at them. Like I'm not a, how I say, a worshiper of that stuff. I'm, I'm a worshiper of genuine people, you know, hardworking people. You know, if you got motion going, you really into what you're doing, like that needs to be told, you know, because everybody, like you say, everybody's on the path, you know. And uh, yeah. I feel like while you're on the road, you know, everybody deserves their flowers, you know, everybody. So definitely was an honor to bring you on here and get your flowers. But Last but not least, you know, what does the word underdog mean to you or when you hear the word underdog? When I hear the word underdog, um, I think about one of my major philosophical influences. Um, It's a a gentleman named uh, Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell um, was probably the preeminent, if not one of the top three Western American philosophers that we have in history. He was a white guy, um, taught at uh, Sarah Lawrence College in uh, New York for over 30 years, and um, really incredible thinker. But he came up with this idea called the hero's journey. And so the hero um, in most movies that you watch follows the script called The Hero's Journey, and it's broken up into three different components. Um, First is uh, departure. The hero feels the wind against his back, and he feels um, some sort of calling or some sort of uh, purpose that he's drawn towards. And so he goes on this epic quest. And then along the way, you know, he meets people who are in the realm of whatever this quest is that he's on, and they initiate him. So there's the uh, departure, and then there's the initiation, and that's where most of the action happens in most of the movies that you watch. Um, and then ultimately, at the end, there's the return. So it's departure, initiation, and return. And um, when you when you return, a lot of times people aren't ready for that information that you've learned that you were initiated in. 
Um, so there's usually an adjustment period or you'll get people fighting back against you from where you're from um, because they don't want to digest this new information that you learned on your hero's journey. And so when I think about an underdog, I think about um, uh, the hero who was the hero the whole movie, whether he started off sweeping floors on the beginning of the movie and blah, blah, blah. But in that movie, he was always the hero from the first credits. But it took him to have to go through all of these trials and all this initiation for him to realize that he was the hero the whole time. And um, that's what I think the underdog is, is, is the hero. Most definitely, man. There y'all have it, man. Season five, free gems the whole time. I felt so educated, man. It was just like stuff was just deep, man. But definitely appreciate the conversation, brother. But this was season five, episode 11, Follow Your Bliss, The Art of Unlearning, featuring Savannah Zone, By Way of Atlanta, multidisciplinary artist and futurist renaissance Ralph Dillard. Make sure y'all head over to renswork.com. Also, renswork.com on Instagram. I appreciate you, brother. Respect, man. Respect. Thank you. Nothing but gratitude. I appreciate it, man. Enjoy the rest of your night, homie. You too, King. All right. Go mouth, rabbit on my teeth. I got carrots. Open up a mouth to see. Got vocal sound like Janet. Marble on the floors, but the kitchen kind of granite. Lean color perk. You would think it's pomegranate. I see flying saucers still on roll another planet. It will fall in place if it's meant to be organic. I got crazy lingo. You would think I'm speaking Spanish. Or something like a pine. Never leave without the cannon. I'm enlightened. Ten. I got stones around my neck. I teach her how to earn respect. I walk around with a tag like a mad at the rail. People do any damn thing for a check. So what if you got sign labels, throw them on the shelf? I don't ask for hell, I just go within myself. Hard times I prevail. I bust up by myself. I let my nuts hang. Cause they don't got no curfew.